If you have your Bibles, I pray that you do, turn to the book of Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, we're going to read verses 12 through 13. I would ask you to, um, to try to make sure that you have some kind of a Bible. If you have a phone, as I've always said, I like for you to really follow along. I like for you to see and be able to um, understand that what I'm telling you is not just my opinion. It's not just what I think. It's what the Word of God says. And that is important that you understand that no matter what you think of me, no matter how it sounds coming from me, the bottom line is it's the Word of God and the power is in the Word of God. The Bible tells us that this Word of God is living and it is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword and it has the ability and the power to cut into your life and cut out all the cancers of sin that do not belong. And so I pray that you'll be paying attention to it and seeing it for yourself this morning. I know you've stood already, but just one more time, if you don't mind, if you have the means and you're able, we'll stand as we give reverence to this living and powerful Word. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. You can be seated. Father, we come to you this morning and we want to um, ask you to give us the ability that we need to hear your word, to receive it, to, um, to have our blinded eyes um, made whole so that we can see, God. Father, our flesh doesn't want, to, uh, doesn't want to see this word. It doesn't want it to be revealed. And so, Father, I pray today that... Father, you would overcome that. Father, I pray that there would be not one person here today that, that leaves here without hearing and understanding your word. And, and it is my prayer that all would. And so, Father, I pray this morning that you would just help us to be able to do that. Lord, this is your word. This is not ours. And we, we trust you in it. We know, God, that you will accomplish your purpose, whatever you sent it out for. Father, we pray for those... Of, uh, in our body this morning that are sick, uh, are fighting sickness this morning. Father, we pray for Mary McGrew. Father, we, we pray for Thomas King. And Father, we pray for those that are um, still fighting cancer or awaiting results or, or awaiting treatments. And Father, we lift them up to you this morning. And we just pray as we have many times before. Lord, if it be your will, we pray you would heal them. Father, it's a small thing for you. You made this body and it, you did it from dust. Lord, so I know that, that there is nothing that you can't fix in it. And so, Father, we just ask you this morning that, Lord, you would hear the desire of our heart, and if it be your will, that you'd give us that desire to heal those bodies. And, Father, we just trust you. We know that no matter what you do, that you are good. Your plans for us are good, not evil. And so, Father, we pray that you give us faith to trust you. Lord, that whatever purpose you have for these sicknesses, Father, that you, your purpose would be accomplished in it, whatever it is. Father, we love you. Thank you for everything you do for us. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So today we're talking about um, obeying. We're talking about the, the commands of God that Paul has been giving us up to this point. So I want to make sure that you keep this in context because this is a verse that many people have taken out of context and they have made it sound like we have to work to maintain our salvation. They have made it sound like we have to um, be good enough in order to make sure that we stay saved. And that if we don't do it with fear and trembling, that, that we should fear and tremble lest we lose our salvation. And so I want you to be able to see the context of, the, of where Paul is coming from because when you read it, in the proper context that Paul has said it in, 
you will see very clearly that that is not what he is saying. And so I want you to notice this morning that in verse 12, the very first word he starts off with is what? Therefore. Some versions say wherefore. Some versions say so then. This and this and this. The point being is that this is a connecting word that Paul wants us to understand that he's trying to draw our attention to everything he has previously said. Now if you'll keep reading verse 12, it says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed. And so what we see here is that Paul wants them to obey like they have been doing. If you were to keep reading, it says, As you have always obeyed in my presence, so now do it even more so in my absence. So again, looking at the context here, here's what Paul wants. He wants you to obey the commands that he has just previously given and he wants to know that you are doing it even though he's not there. Now listen, it's one thing. How many of you will be honest with me this morning and say that in front of certain godly people, maybe pastors or preachers, you, you, you sometimes talk a little different. Or maybe around people that, that are not pastors and preachers, you talk a lot different. Right? I've actually had people tell me before, um, and, and, and I, this is not a bad thing, but before they tell me something, they'll say, now listen, I don't need you to be my pastor right now. And you know what's coming next, right? And so here's the thing. What Paul is saying is, as long as Paul was there, they were doing these things. They were obeying these things. But now he wants to make sure that it's not just him that they are accountable to. Paul wants to know that they are obeying what he's been teaching them because of their accountability unto God, not just Paul. And so at the end of the day, you don't need to be somebody different in the church because of the people that you are around. You need to be the same person whether you're around Christian people, around pastors, or whether you're out there in the world with the ungodly. No matter where you are, you should walk a different walk. And so Paul wants to know that they will obey. So the next thing we have to ask is this. Obey what? Well, let's just go back and see. You remember I've been teaching you, especially on Wednesday nights, that one of the questions we ask when we're studying a scripture is, is there a command to follow? So when I'm studying these scriptures, one of the questions I look, is there instruction for me to follow? Is there a command for me to follow? Well, let's look back at some of Paul's previous statements. Look back at chapter 2. For sake of time, I'm not going to read them all to you. I'm just going to pick out the commands so that you can see them. Start at verse 3 of chapter 2. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. And then as you know from last week's sermon, we saw that he gives the example of what that looks like, the greatest example in the life of Jesus Christ. So I ask you, is there a command to follow? Well, yes. The first command would be, I put off my selfish ambition or any conceit. Remember, selfish ambition uh, comes from the fact that I think of myself more highly than I should. So selfish ambition and conceit are tied together at the hip. Alright? And then he says, to consider others as more significant than yourself. And so is that a command that you are to follow? Yes. And you do that by putting on humility, by recognizing who you are. And what did we say last week? Who am I? I am the greatest sinner that I know. Who are you? You are the greatest sinner that you know. I promise you, you will never be able, you should never be able to look at somebody else and go, well, they're a worse sinner than me. Because the truth of the matter is, the only thing you know about that person is just what you can see. But let me tell you what you know about you. You know what you think. You know what enters your heart. You know the words that don't ever come out of your mouth but are here. You know who you are. And so you can follow the command, count others as more significant than myself because I'm not conceited. I know who I am. I know who I am. 
And so I'm able to count you as more significant than myself. So there's a command to follow. We don't look out for our own interests, but the interest of others. And all these are tied together. Let's back up a little bit more. Uh, look up at um, chapter 1, verse 27. This is the other command. And all of these are tied together, okay? This is how we get to the word therefore. 27, he says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And so the first command is this. Live in such a way that your life matches what you say you believe. So there's a command to follow. So live a life that matches what you say you believe. It's worthy of the gospel and what you believe. All right, keep reading. So that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you. So he don't know if he's going to come and see him. He don't know if he's going to be absent or not. But I want to hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind. That's all one thing. So here he's talking about unity. So here's a command to follow. I want to know that you are walking and living a life that is worthy of the gospel and I want to know that as a church you're doing it together. You're standing firm in the truth and you are following everything that I've laid out for you. You're doing it with one spirit and one mind. He's talking about the unity of the body. Keep reading. And striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Now for sake of time, I'm not going to pick out everything, but here's what you need to understand. The Apostle Paul wants the Philippian church to do this. He wants them to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. Okay? He wants them to do it standing firm together as a body of Christ. Because again, as we read from Ephesians chapter 4, as each part does its share, growth occurs. As each part does its share, we all attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Jesus Christ. Okay? And so the way that we walk in a manner worthy of the gospel is by the design that God has put together in the church. And we do that by striving together side by side. We won't stand together in unity if we're not striving to walk side by side for the faith of the gospel, right? So I have to wrestle to walk side by side with you because you don't always do or say everything right. I don't always do or say everything right. And so we have to strive to do it. And the only way we're going to strive to say side by side is if we don't think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, but we consider others as more significant than myself. And I'm the worst sinner that I know. So I look out for your interest and not just my own. Do you see the command that Paul is laying down here? Now take that context and go back with me to chapter 2, verse 12. Remember, he, ended, he, ended, he, he did chapter 2, verse 1 through 11, giving us the example of someone who laid aside who he was and took on human flesh and considered others as more significant than himself. And, and he, he gave us the perfect example. And so then he goes in the very next verse of verse 12 and he says, Therefore, based on all this that I've commanded and told you, the example I've given you, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed. In other words, Paul knows that they've been doing this. This has been a healthy church. This has been a church that has walked together in unity. This has been a church that has striven together side by side for the faith of the gospel. This has been a church that has considered each other as more significant than themselves. This has been a church that has walked in a manner worthy of the gospel, not just in the church, but outside of the church. And now he says to them, As you have always obeyed, so now I'm asking you, not only as in my presence, but even much more in my absence. Here's what I want you to do. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now again, when you put this in the context, you understand what He wants you to obey is not that you work for your salvation. What He wants you to understand is working for your salvation does not mean working to be saved. 
It means to work out your salvation. Do you know how I know that? I'll give you several ways, but just go to the next part of verse um, 13. Here's why. What's the first word of verse 13? Four. Here's why you have to work out your salvation. For it is God who does what? So because God is at work where? In you. Now you are to do what with what's in you? Work it out. Work out your salvation. In other words, work out striving for unity. Work out walking in a manner worthy of the gospel. Work out counting others as more significant than yourself. Are these things that come natural? Do you naturally say, you're more significant than me? No, you don't. Naturally you say, I am God, hear me roar. Naturally, that's what you do because that's what life is all about. It's about me. And so naturally, that don't take place. So he says, work out side of you what is at work inside of you. And so here he is summing up all of the things that he has commanded by saying, you've been obeying this now. As you have obeyed, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I can take you back. I'll show you. Uh, one, one example that I can show you is that the word salvation, Paul actually uses it in chapter 1, verse 19. Chapter 1, verse 19. Look there with me. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. This is the exact same word. We just translated deliverance here in the English language. But in the Greek, it's the same word that we translate salvation in chapter 2, verse 12. And so here, the word salvation is not being used for Paul being saved. He's not talking about being born again. He's saying that, I know through your prayers and the help of the Spirit, this is going to turn out for my deliverance from prison. So in other words, salvation for him did not necessarily, this word did not necessarily mean the moment that God gives you a new heart and a new mind and causes you to be born again. He's not talking about that. So when he says work out your salvation with fear and trembling, he don't mean work out the gift of being born again that God has given you. I could take you to another example if you want to go there. Let's look at um, chapter 1 verse 28. In Philippians, Paul uses this word again. He says, And not frightened in anything by your opponents, this is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. Now here he's not talking to believers about when their opponents, when their opponents oppose them, this means that they are going to be saved. That's not what he means. They're already saved. They're already Christians. So why does he use this word salvation? He's talking about the evidence coming out that they are being conformed to Christ. That no matter what comes against them, they don't lose hope. They don't quit striving side by side. They don't quit standing together in unity. It's a sign to their opponents that what they have on the inside is evident by what they do on the outside. And so there again, when he uses his word salvation, he's not necessarily saying that this is a sign that you will be born again. He's saying that work out your salvation, literally this sanctification process. Work out of you what God is doing inside of you. Everybody tracking with me this morning? All right. So with that being said, let's answer this next question. How do we work out this salvation? How do we follow the commands of staying in unity and striving side by side and counting others as more humble? How do we do that? Well, here's how Paul says he does it since it's not natural. The first thing in verse 12 of chapter 2, he says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now obey. Here's the first thing you have to do. Obey. How many of you, I mean, I've preached this pretty clearly, I feel like. Now maybe you've left here every Sunday going, I ain't got a clue what that man said. 
I don't, if you did that, I apologize to you. I don't think I preached in that way. But I feel like every Sunday that I've left here going through this series through Philippians that I have been very clear on what the Word of God says. But how many of us have actually obeyed it? How many of us have actually said, there is a command for me to follow and I am going to go out today and I'm going to follow it? How many of you have actually said, here's how I can count so-and-so as more significant than myself? Here's how I can humble myself to strive for unity. Here's how I can, I can wrestle to stay side by side with those in the faith for the faith of the gospel. How many of us have actually said, here's how this applies to my life and I am going to obey? And so the first thing you have to do is very simple. Obey. Do it. Stand together in unity. Firm in one spirit and one mind. We, are all, we all belong to the same body. No matter how many differences we have. Right? No matter what kind of sins you have versus what kind of sins I have. We all stand together in this same fight against our sin. And so I am going to obey the scripture when it tells me to stand firm in one spirit and one mind. And I am going to obey the scripture when it says to strive side by side for the faith of the gospel. And I am going to obey the scripture when it says to humble myself like Christ did for me and count others as more significant than myself and look out for their interests before my own. You know, I, I, I need to apologize to you because um, I don't know why. I always am a worried that our people are not going to be took care of. So like, for instance, I feel like we're all so busy. We are, ain't we? I mean, we're all too busy. We got too much going on. I grew up in a time that, man, the women just got together and they just threw a meal together and they just cooked and they, and I grew up in a time, I grew up in a different time. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Well, yesterday, whenever we were feeding the Archer family, it was a few days beforehand, I was like, man, I just don't know if anybody's going to be able to do anything. I mean, we're all so busy and it wasn't a, a strike against you. I just didn't have enough faith to believe that you would actually lay some of your time aside to actually look after somebody else. And then out of nowhere, Chassie comes over to me and she showed me the text message. She said, look at everybody that's bringing food. Look at this and look at that. And I looked down through there and I mean it was just loaded with people. We're bringing this and we're bringing that. We're doing this and doing that. And I love to see that even though we live together in such a busy society today, that if at all possible, we will consider others as more significant than ourselves, and we'll lay aside our time and we will come to serve someone else. And I'm telling you, I am, I'm thankful for people that do that. And that's just one way out of many ways that we can count others as more significant than ourselves and humble ourselves so that we look out for others' interests instead of just our own. And so I love to see people obey that scripture because that's when you really, it's in times like that that you really see the church working the way that it is designed to work. So that's the first thing, just obey. That's how you work out your salvation. The second way, you obey with fear and trembling. Now this is a tough one because today you have been taught that the fear of God is not fear, it's just reverence. And it's just awe. That's what you've been taught. We have took the wrath of God completely away from Him and said, God is love. God is grace. God is mercy. Now are all those things true? Absolutely they're true. But you'd make no mistake about it. God is wrathful too. And God is just. And God is going to serve justice on all wrongs. He will right every wrong. Either on the cross of Calvary through the death of Christ or through you paying for it for an eternity in hell. One of two ways justice will be served. And you better believe He is wrathful against sin. 
And so here we see that Paul says, Obey with fear and trembling. Now, I can't take you through all the hundreds of commands in the Bible that tell us to fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 24. Joshua chapter 24 verse 14. 1 Samuel chapter 12 verse 14. Psalm chapter 2 verse 11. And then pick any other psalm throughout the word. Go to the Proverbs. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. You want to be wise? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of it. Now so what I want you to get in your head this morning is that Yes, we are saved from His wrath, but the fear of the Lord is still fear. Make no mistake about it. But it's a healthy fear. And we're going to look at what that means here from Scriptures. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 5. Hold your place in Philippians. Deuteronomy Deuteronomy is the fourth book in the Old Testament. Chapter 5, verse 22 through 29. Let me tell you what's going on before I read this to you. You remember when Moses was fixing to go up on the mountains and get the Ten Commandments? The people decided they wanted God to speak to them. So they began to approach the mountain. God said, okay, bring them near. (laughs) And when they come near, all of a sudden fire came out and the wind blew and rocks shattered and trumpets blasted and I'm talking about they were scared to death. And they backed off and they said, I'll tell you what, Moses, you just talk to God and then you talk to us and let not God speak to us lest we die. And so they had a fear of God in them. But this is the context that we're reading in Deuteronomy chapter 6 beginning in verse 22. Listen to what it says. These words the Lord spoke to all your assembly at the mountain out of the midst of the fire the cloud and the thick darkness with a loud voice, and he added no more. He's talking about the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. And as soon as you heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness while the mountain was burning with fire, you came near to me. All the heads of your tribes and your elders, and you said, Behold, the Lord our God has shown us His glory and His greatness, and we have heard His voice out of the midst of the fire. This day we have seen God speak with man, and man still live. Now therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more, we shall die. For who is there of all flesh that have heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of fire as we have and has still lived? Go near, Moses, and hear all that the Lord our God will say, and then you speak to us all that the Lord our God will speak to you, and we will hear and do it. And then look at verse 28. And the Lord heard your words, and when He spoke to me, the Lord said to me, I have heard the words of this people which they have spoken to you, and they are right in all that they have spoken. And look at verse 29. This is the important part. Oh, that they had such a heart as this always to fear me and to keep all of my commandments that it might go well with them and with their descendants forever. Now let me ask you a question. Looking at God's desire right there, do you think that fear is just a reverence and an awe? No. Right here you see very clearly that the fear that God is talking about is indeed Fear. Again, these are God's people. Not a fear that He is absolutely going to consume them, but a fear that in and of themselves, I cannot just come to God the way that I am. No, I have to come to God through someone else. And at that time, it was Moses. God had appointed Moses to be the one that can stand before Him, and then Moses stands before God. He's the one in between God and man. Today, we have a better Moses. We have Jesus that stands between God and man. And so I think the Bible disagrees with these teachers that say the fear of God is not fear. So think about it like this. God didn't follow up His desire that His people fear Him and keep His commandments by assuring them that I mean no harm, did He? He didn't say to Moses, Oh, tell them to come on up closer. Tell them to get on in here. I don't mean them any harm. No, God understood there is a wrathful side against sin and you do not want to meet that on your own. 
And so it was healthy that they had a fear of God to keep His commandments. So He used His fear as a way to motivate them to obey Him by letting them know that anyone that is not right with Him will perish in his sin. Now here's the way that I want to give you the example before I give you some more scriptures to point it out. These examples come from John Piper, uh, a teacher that I love to, to follow and listen to. He said, I went to, he said, I went to visit a man named Dick Teagan. I had Karsten, my six-year-old, with me. Dick had a dog at the door, and when we opened the door, he looked my six-year-old Karsten eyeball to eyeball. He said, this is a giant dog. He said, I sent Karsten back to the car to grab something that we had forgotten. And Karsten took off running and went loping up behind the six-year-old at his very height with a little low growl. And Karsten was terrified. And Dick leaned out the door and shouted to Karsten. He said, Karsten... Maybe you better not run. He doesn't like it when people run away from him. Just walk beside him. You can even put your hand around his neck. And then he compared it like this. God is horrifically dangerous to run away from. And we should be terrified to think that we could run away from God. But if we will stay with him, his growl is a growl for our protection. Think about that. If we will stay with Him, then His growl is a growl that we are getting away from Him. The fear of the Lord says to us, Hey, it's dangerous out there. Y'all tracking with me? A healthy fear of the Lord sees us in our sin and says to us, You don't want to be there. That's not a safe place. Let me give you another example that He gives. One last image. He says, I love the picture of a big, holy, sovereign, and majestic God. So I picture myself climbing high in the mountains, say the Himalayas. And I'm on these massive rock faces, and I see a storm coming. Now picture this. You're on a massive rock face climbing this mountain, and you look out, and there is a massive storm coming. He says next, it is going to be a massive storm, and I feel unbelievably vulnerable on these mountain precipices. And so I am desperately looking for a little covert or a cleft in the rock where I won't be blown off the side of the cliff to destruction. And I find one in the side of the mountain. And I spin quickly and get in the, cl the cleft of the rock. And suddenly the holiness and justice and the power and the wrath and the judgment of God breaks over me like a hurricane. But I know that I am totally safe in the cleft of the rock. And this means that I can enjoy it rather than just completely fearing it. And I think that this is what the cross is. Jesus died for us to provide us a place where we could enjoy the majesty of God with a kind of fear and trembling that does have reverence and all, but not a cowering fear. So in other words, it's not a fear that says, man, I've got to work and if I don't work hard enough, then I'm not going to be accepted by Him. No, you're in the cleft of the rock. The cleft of the rock is Jesus Christ. That's why they call Him the rock of ages. And so you are hidden in the cleft of the rock. But outside of this cleft, when you look out, you still see the storm that is coming out there. You're safe from it in here. But guess what, the, guess what fearing that storm does for you? It keeps you. The fear of God being fear keeps you. It protects you. And it makes you keep looking out going, I don't want that. I don't want that. That's what I'm being saved from. That's why I'm in the cleft of the rock. That's why I'm staying in the cleft of the rock. You know the reason why you walk out so easy of the cleft of the rock into your own sin? You know why you so easily, come on y'all with me, y'all know why you so easily follow your own sin? Because you don't have a healthy fear of God. You don't fear enough. See, anybody that says they have a fear of God but they try to run away from Him? Do you think you can run away from God? See, you're out here and you think, man, I'm just a sinner, so I might as well just stay out here. I might as well just quit. You think that's your safe place? 
What is your only option that you have to be in the safe place? Get in the cleft of the rock. Put your arm and stay near around Him. And if you will do that and you will continually look at the wrath of God on sin and have a healthy fear, I want you to think about it like this. Um, my dad was a disciplinary. Anybody in here had a dad that was a disciplinary? My dad beat the fool out of me sometimes, literally. He was a disciplinary. And I had a fear of my dad. Let me tell you something. A lot of people say, well, the fear of dad is just reverence and all. I disagree. I feared dad. Now, did that mean that I feared him to the point that I wouldn't come to him and hug him? Did that mean that I didn't think dad loved me? No. Matter of fact, if I needed a hug from dad, I'd go hug dad. If I, if I needed to go up and talk to dad about something, I could go up and talk. I knew that there was safety in dad. But I also knew that if I walk away from dad and dad's instructions, guess what's coming? The fear of dad is a healthy thing. And so what I need to get across to you today is that if you are going to obey Him, then you are going to need fear and trembling to do it. Not a fear and trembling that cowers you away from Him, but a fear and trembling that says, I want to stay in the safety of the rock. I want to stay in the safety of my Father. And I know who my Father is. The book of Hebrews tells us this. He said that... Um, he said um, that our Father chastises and disciplines those who He loves. And if you are without discipline, then you are an illegitimate child. You know what that means? That means that if you're a sinner and you're not receiving some discipline from God and you don't understand that it's discipline, the truth of the matter is you may not even really be His child is the problem. See, here's the thing about it. I've got, um, uh, say for instance, my niece. Um, or, or one of your kids. Now, I'm quick to jerk my boy up and wear his butt out, right? But am I as quick to jerk my niece up and wear her butt out? No, never have. You know why? Because that's not my child. Now, do I love her? Yes, I love her. But I'm probably not going to discipline her the way that I am my child because that's not my child. I'm not saying I won't if she needs it. I'm just saying that God is going to discipline His children. But someone that's not His, the truth of the matter is, He may not discipline. And so we have to understand that the discipline of God is a good thing and a healthy fear of our Father is not a bad thing. And so this is a fear that motivates you to stay near Him, not run away from Him. A healthy fear makes you want to examine yourself and see if we're not walking with Him. And that healthy fear drives us back to Him for safety. If you are not driven back to Him from your sin, you do not have a fear of God. You don't have a healthy fear and trembling to be able to work out your salvation. And so we should fear in the sense that we know and see the greatness of God's wrath towards sin. And this keeps us sheltering in Christ safely from His wrath. It is reverence and all. I don't want to take that away from the teachers. But too many teachers today, and if you've been in church any length of time, you know what I'm talking about. Every teacher that teaches the fear of the Lord says to you, it's more like reverence. It's more like all. Wrong. It is reverence and all, but the reason you reverence and all is because you have a healthy fear of who He is. And it drives you to Him for safety. So again, <clears throat> obey is the first step of working out your salvation. Obey with fear and trembling is the second way you work out your fear and salvation. And then let's get to number three, Philippians chapter 2. Go back here with me. Philippians chapter 2. And let's start with verse 13. For it is God 
who works in you both to will and to work for your good pleasure. Here's the third way you work out your salvation. By realizing who it is that is at work in you. You need to understand something. This is not you and your work. This is something that has happened to you and now is at work in you. I want you to understand something. Before you heard the gospel and believed the gospel and it changed your heart, you didn't care about being obedient to God. You didn't care about being disobedient to God. You had no real desire in you to actually be true and faithful to God. Instead, your desire was to be true and faithful to whatever you wanted. And as long as God lined up with that, then you followed God. But if God didn't line up with that, you did what you wanted to do. So now, through the gospel, God has given you eyes to be able to see your rebellion against Him. And you can see that you were in darkness of sin and that He's calling you to the light of Christ. And so here, He is at work in you. He causes you to be born again. What do I mean by that? He gives you a new heart. He gives you a heart that now you have desire to be obedient to Him. Before being born again... You didn't have that. So now you have a desire in you that says, God, I want to be obedient to you. And now you have this this, uh, fear and trembling of, of who He is that leads you and motivates you to follow Him. But it is God that is at work in you. It is God that gives you the desire. It is God that gives you the knowledge how to follow you. It is God that gives you the power to follow you. It is God that is at work in you. So now because you see God at work in you, as I told you before, if you'll recognize that this is God, work it out. Work it out. Guys, do you know what a privilege it is to be able to look at your life and say, I see the evidence that God is at work in me. I see the evidence that God is changing my heart. Now, am I, am I there yet? No, I'm not. But do you even see a desire inside of you to be obedient to Him? Do you have a desire inside of you to lay aside your sinfulness and follow Him? Then realize that that is God at work in you. What a privilege to know that the God of all creation is at work in me. In me. It is God who works in you. And He works in you by two ways. Look what He says next. It is God who works in you both to what? Y'all read it. To what? To will. To will. It is God who works in you to will. In other words, without God at work in you, you wouldn't even have a will to be obedient. Y'all with me? The very evidence that you have a will to follow Him is the very evidence that says God is at work in me and He's at work in me to even give me the will to follow Him. So because God is at work in you, obey. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why fear and trembling? Because it's who that's at work in you? Because it's God that's at work in you. And if you know who God is, there ought to be some fear and trembling there. That He is at work in you to give you the will to obey. And what do you do? You don't obey? Let me ask y'all a question. Anybody ever uh, watched a kid do something and go, Man, if I did that, my daddy would have... Y'all know what I'm talking about? That's the way I feel about you right now. If If you're one of those that God is at work in you, but you're not working out your salvation and you don't have fear and trembling, I'm looking at you going, boy, if I did that, my daddy would. If I lived that way, you know what God would do? I'm just telling you right now, I know that I am a child of His, even as a sinner. And I know what my daddy will do to me because He loves me. 
Not because He wants to punish me, because my Father knows for my child's safety, I cannot allow Him to keep walking this direction. And because of that, my Father will always discipline me. And so, recognize who it is that's at work in you because He's at work in you to will, to give you the desire, to follow Him, to be obedient to Him, and He is in there to work for what? For what? For His good pleasure. I want to read a couple of scriptures to you to show how Paul recognized this in his life. These are the last two scriptures I'll read. Romans chapter 15 verse 18. Look at the way Paul recognized any work that he did. It was not him. <laughs> Any work Paul did, and Paul, this is a guy that, that saw more people come to the Lord than anybody I know. Um, and, and yet, all the work that he did, all of the churches that he built and loved and was a part of, and yet, this is what he would say about it. Romans 15 verse 18. Romans 15 verse 18 says this, For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. Who did it? Christ did it. Paul said, I'm not going to venture to speak about anything that, that, that I did Except, I tell you what I will talk about, what Christ did through me. Paul recognizes that in and of myself, nothing good dwells. Any of y'all figured that out about you yet? In and of myself, nothing good dwells. But go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Last scripture we'll read. Verse 10. First Corinthians 15 verse 10. It says, "But by the grace of God, I am what I am." And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than anybody. So here Paul says he worked, right? Paul said he did it, right? Keep reading. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Here's the way that Paul understood why he did what he did. Why he worked the way that he worked. Why he lived the way that he lived. Because it's only by the grace of God that I am who I am. Only by the grace of God is he at work in me to will and to work for His pleasure because even though I worked harder than anybody else, it wasn't me who was the one working. The grace of God in me. It was Christ that did the work. It was the grace of God in me. In and of myself, nothing good dwells, but I work out my salvation. Or I work, we work out. And that's another thing to remember in Philippians chapter 2. Paul's not talking to individuals. Go to Philippians 1 verse 1 and you'll see this is to all the saints. He's talking to the church. And here he says in Philippians chapter 2, work out your, plural, your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who is at work in you to will and to work for His good pleasure. So I say it again. Working out your salvation does not mean Working to be saved. It means I am working to stand firm in truth and in unity of the church. I am working to strive side by side with the church for the faith of the gospel. I am working to humble myself and count others as more significant than myself 
in the church for the faith of the gospel. I am looking out for others' interest and not just my own in the church for the faith of the gospel. And I obey these things as commands from the Lord. And I obey them with fear and trembling because I know who He is and I'm staying in the cleft of the rock because that fear keeps me here. And I do it because I know who it is that's at work in me. And I know that without Him, I wouldn't even have the will to work. And without Him, I would not work for His good pleasure. So because of those things, I work harder than them all. Yet not I, but the grace of God that is at work in me. So what am I saying to you this morning? This is homecoming. This is where we celebrate the heritage of our church. And I am where I am today because of the ministry that this church had long before I ever sat foot in it. Are you who you are today because of anything to do with the ministry of this church? Has my preaching helped you at all in your Christian faith? Has, has your um, brothers and sisters in Christ been there for you at all through tough times? Have you walked together growing in your faith together? It is because people maintained the unity and, stru- and, and were striving together side by side and humbling themselves. It's because the church operated the way that it did and they obeyed that I am who I am today. And many of you are who you are today because of the work that Christ has done in me, Nick, Kirby, so many others, Ronnie. And so I'm telling you today that I'm celebrating our church's heritage because I'm thankful for the ministry that God worked in people, but they obeyed because they saw it was Him working in them. And I'm asking you today, to examine yourself. Does the unity of the church and does the church mean anything to you at all? Is it just a tradition? Is it just something you get up and come do? Or do you understand that you're part of something? Is is walking and striving together with brothers and sisters in Christ and letting them minister to you so that you grow in your faith? Because as I've told you many times before, I am a preacher that will tell you The Bible teaches outside of the church and the fellowship there in it. I'm not talking about the preacher service. I'm talking about being a part of the church, not just come and listen to preaching. Outside of the church, there is no growth in your faith. I'm sorry. I don't care how much you love the Lord and you raise your hands and you worship. And I don't care how much you think you and God are like this right here. I'm telling you what God designed for you to grow in your faith. And if you really believe for one second that you're going to grow in your faith outside of His design, you know more than God. You, you know how to grow yourself better than God knows how to grow you. No. No. And so I'm telling you, if there's anything in you at all of a desire to be obedient to God, then do everything in you to work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it's God that's at work in you, both to will in you and to work for His good pleasure. And the work He's talking about is the work where we come together in unity and we stand firm in one spirit and one mind and we obey the command to strive together side by side for the faith of the gospel. And we do that by humbling ourselves and counting others as more significant than ourselves. And y'all have heard this a million times by now, right? But do you get it? Will you obey? You won't without fear and trembling. And you won't without recognizing that it is, a, it is God that is at work in you. And if you do those things and you recognize that, you'll get to work. And you'll work out your salvation with fear and trembling, following the work of Christ inside of you. And one day you'll say, I worked harder than them all, yet not I, but Christ in me.